Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this edition of the 6 p.m. Primetime News Cast on Equinox Television, broadcasting from Cameroon's economic capital Douala. My name is Pablo Jonathan News. Just streaming into our newsroom indicates that the 10 persons kidnapped in Livanda village in the southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon have been set free. They were set free by Navy forces who have details with our correspondent in Limbe in this edition of the news. She just told her story. According to her, she narrated what she went through in the course of her escape from violence in the two English-speaking regions of the Republic of Cameroon. She spoke to Parole de Femme on Equinox Television and now she's in detention. She's been interrogated and allegedly been forced to sign a document to say that she was paid to narrate a fake story on Equinox Television. Tonight we're bringing to you our findings on the veracity of the story of the lady who spoke to Equinox Television and was later arrested. And we begin this newscast in Livanda Village, Limbe, southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. Latest information streaming in from there indicates that the 10 persons who were kidnapped by armed men have been set free. And they were set free by elements of the Navy. We go back to what happened in Livanda Village with our correspondent, David Sunmaimo. Davidson Maimo with that report on the persons who were kidnapped in the Limbe in the southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. They were kidnapped in Livanda village. We should indicate that kidnapping and other atrocities have been on the rise in the two English speaking regions of the Republic of Cameroon. We go back to what exactly happened in Livanda village with our correspondent, Davidson Maimo. We are at Livanda village. Today is Tuesday, it's the 11th of November 2020. And of course, we are told that on Monday, the 10th of November 2020, unidentified gunmen actually got into this quarter and kidnapped about 10 persons, taken to the forest, the Limada forest, as we are told. And we are going to understand that the defense and the security forces immediately respond after they were informed. And of course, coming the entire area to no avail. And until about 5 in the evening, that we are made to understand that two persons were later released. One, a teenage girl, and another, a pregnant woman, a pregnant woman that was released. She, the two of them, were among the ten persons that were kidnapped. As we speak to you, the people of Livanda Village did not actually sleep. As, of course, fear, panicking, actually stricken. They were stricken panic the whole night, sleeping with one eye closed and one eye open for the fear of the unknown. But nevertheless, today, Tuesday, the, the 11th of November, they have gotten up with enough courage to actually carry on their normal activities. You can see behind me an indication that most of the people living in this, this area are all farmers. As you see, they are going to the market with food stuff from plantains to cocoa yam to vegetable. And that is the livelihood of the people of Livanda Village. And information reaching me says that the chief of Livanda, Chief Matthias Motia Matthias, actually has called on whosoever is behind the kidnapping to actually release the people that are under their custody, pleading that most of those kidnappers, even IDPs, saying that most of these people are farmers. They got nothing to do as far as the ongoing anglophone crisis is concerned. And of course, Equinox Television will be bringing to you updates as far as the situation is concerned. I'm David C. Maimo for Equinox Television, live in Limada Village, Limbe 1 Subdivision, Fako Division, Southwest Region. And Davidson Maimo has been no see news, getting updates on that incident in the southwest region of Cameroon. And he now comes up with updates indicating uh, that the other hostages, the other persons who were still in captivity, have been set free. Davidson Maimo. Tuesday, the 10th of November 2020, Livanda Village. Limbe 1 Subdivision, Fako Division, Southwest Region. Though afraid of the unknown, the people are going about their normal activities despite the abduction of 10 persons on Monday the 9 at Opatowe, one of the neighborhoods within the village by alleged separatist fighters. In a chat with Chief Motia Matthias Motia of Livanda Village, 
He reveals that the incident took place at about 3.30 p.m. on Monday the 9th. These women, they gathered, they were buying plantains, banana from other farmers who were coming from the farm with um, foodstuffs. There is a point that these women, they always sit in the evening by afternoon to wait for farmers. That is where they were. And there, there is a small off license by the side where um, some other persons were there drinking. And um, this, these guys entered the booked every bottle that were in that off license and even the proprietor of the off license too is one of the people that were kidnapped. Among the 10 abducted was a pregnant woman and a teenage girl who were later released by the kidnappers. Six women and um, um, four men. Two were released, one teenage girl and um, one pregnant woman. They were released yesterday in the evening, but the rest of them I have not seen any other person that has been released. They are still in the bush. Sources say, according to the released, Chief Motia is on the list of the kidnappers, accusing him for putting in place a vigilante to fight the separatists. The vigilante of Livanda was created to keep peace and order within Livanda village, not to fight the separatists. The military are there to fight the separatists, not the vigilante. If Motia questioned the crime of those abducted, pleading with the kidnappers to have compassion and release all those in their custody. And also may they be arrested some of these people then, they get a mass population for their house where now the IDPs them, they don't live from different, different affected areas the way they don't come out for inside Northwest and Southwest region. Now they take them go for bush. Wait till they don't do, wait till they really get these people where they take and go for bush, where to be their problem with inside Anglophone crisis, where they get for suffer these consequences. So at the call on any person where you get hand for this kidnapping, make it release whosoever way they take it enter out and for bush. It is not the first time some persons are kidnapped at Livanda village, with some to have suffered serious molestation, tortured and ransom paid. While the defense and security forces are having a sleepless night, the cry of the populace is for the government of Cameroon and those fighting for what they call the restoration of Southern Cameroon state to reach a consensus so that the bloodshed should end and life to return to normalcy. It is an accomplished mission from a mixed contingent led here by the Navy here in Limbe that includes the Rapid Intervention Unit of the police known by a French acronym as LC, including the Gendarmerie here in Limbe that actually went inside the forest in search of the remaining people that were kidnapped. None of them is actually wounded and all of them have been brought home safely. 24 hours in the hands of their captive, three women and two men are finally free. Colonel Menge Maxel is a Navy commander in Limbe. The defense and security forces is there to protect the people and their property. So we are asking the population to collaborate with us so that we can do our job. Just give us information. That's all we need for people. The five free persons said the kidnappers presented different reasons as to why each of them was adopted. They say, they say, I don't make some small market where they say, they don't like something I say, they say. Okay. They must kill me because now me and they promote I mean the men and they can't carry them for the day. Except I give them five million. They say they work charcoal and no and no and no and never support them. They say we'll buy banana for go stand there. We'll so buy banana for go stand for money. Mm. Mama the same. The same thing, banana for go stand there. Okay. Paradoxically, every belongings, including money, were refunded by their captive. They give the bank, they say what they can go start this thing. Yes, I will go to five. Me, I will go to five. Mm -hmm. I belong by then, I took five with me. They give me the money back. People, they don't pay, will pay back. So, their big man will then sign up, will go away. The administration, defense, and security forces in Limbe have called for calm while urging the population to collaborate and report suspected persons so that peace and security can be achieved. An ex-pro-independence fighter said the disarmament 
Demobilization and the Reintegration Center in the Southwest Regional Capital, Boya, are demanding to know when they will be reunited with their families. They were speaking to former Governor Fai Yengo, Francis Coordinator of the Disarmament, Demobilization and Reintegration uh, Committee, and they are saying that many of them are married and they want to go back to their families. Fai Yengo Francis was visiting them. And we'll come back to that report in a short while with Derek Jato and Boya. Time for us to go over to Bamenda in the northwest region of the country where a fire incident has killed one person. The fire incident is said to have been provoked by illegal manipulation of illegal fuel. It's Manjik and Gabriel report. It was total shock and consternation that gripped the population of Cow Street in Queen Bamenda. Northwest region of Cameroon. A man who was doing illicit business was burnt to death after mixing fuel and kerosene. Illicit manipulation of uh, petrol. That should be discouraged. And it's something that is very recurrent in the town of Bamenda. And you people can see the, the, the disaster. We're just lucky that we were able to. To, to stop the fire before consuming everything that we see around here. So the advice I'll give the population is that uh, they should refrain from this type of activity. It's very dangerous. According to his neighbor, the man in question, who is a security guard at one of the filling stations in Bamenda, was about lighting his stove when the unfortunate incident occurred. <laughs> Alerted, the army rescue soldiers in Bamenda came to put off the flames from spreading. Amongst the numerous onlookers was the city mayor of Bamenda. We are sorry <laughs> for what has happened, but this should be an opportunity for us to denounce some kind of activities. Landlord should know who is in your house and what is he doing. If you had checked earlier, you would have been able to advise your tenants this operation is not correct. It was an opportunity for the city mayor to insist on the importance of people having a legalized building permit from the council since the army rescue soldiers found difficulties in putting up the flames because there was no path for them to get their vehicle into the quarter. If a building permit were to be issued, then each house would have had a means of accessibility. So you can't access the houses because they were not oriented within the building regulations of the city. Because normally every house where people reside should have access in and out of their houses. He also gave out this advice. Please, whatever the case, whether you're putting up a kiosk, you are putting up whatever you're putting, please, it is but important for you to alert the council such that in the case of any incident, we can look from our file and identify where your house is. The body of the security guard who was burned was later buried at the city council cemetery. Now back to the Anglophone crisis, we bring to you uh, details on the story of Victoire Stephanie Njomu, who told her story, who told Equinox Television's La, uh, parole, the farm uh, program, how she suffered, how she managed to escape violence from the southwest region to seek refuge in the littoral region of the country, notably here in Douala. And after speaking or telling her story on parole, the farm, she has been arrested and detained. We went uh, finding out with uh, some of her close relatives, her children, and some of the persons who who were harboring her here in the economic capital, Douala, what they know about the, her story. Take a listen. 
been living in this precarious environment with her children for close to three years. Victoire Stephanie Jomo says she escaped the violence in the southwest region in the heat of the Anglophone crisis close to four years ago to seek refuge here in Bonaberry, Douala Force Subdivision. While her story made public in the program Parole de Farm on Equinox Television is qualified as false on social media, her children testify. Mama en zone anglophone. Mother lived in the Anglophone region in Fiango. She had twins and she lost them in the Anglophone crisis. She came to live with the father of her children and for more than three months we did not know her whereabouts. She later called us and said she was here and we came to live with her. She told viewers of Parole de Femme that she lost almost everything in the crisis, including her identification documents. All her documents were burnt, others destroyed. Her birth certificate, for instance, has no signature and even the writings are fading out. And this is why she has been unable to obtain another national identity card. After many days in the bush covering several kilometers, Victoire Stephanie Jomo arrived alone in the Mungo Division with other internally displaced persons. And from there, she continued to Bonasama to meet the father of her deceased twins. He welcomed her in his father's house. She has been in the Anglophone regions. She's perfectly bilingual. She has been here for three to four years. I know that she has a true story. If you were to consider just what she has said, she and her children are living in precarious conditions. We are suffocating, but God is sustaining us. It is miserable. We have not been going to school. Accused to have been paid to tell a purported fake story on Equinox Television, she has been arrested by security forces. It is said that she was paid by a political party to speak, but it is not true. She just told her story. Many people do not know anything go on social media and say all sorts of things. You may have known her, but you don't know what she has been through. She has done no wrong. She has just said what she went through. Speaking is not synonymous to condemnation. You know the asthmatics. Dans ces conditions -là. Je ne sais pas faut supplier ces gens. The grandfather of her children and other relatives are begging the security authorities to consider the truth and her fragile health situation and free her. The story of Victoire Stephanie Njomo and she is still in detention till now while there are calls for liberation from civil society and human rights organizations yet to yield fruits. Now to the southwest regional chief town, Boya, former pro-independence fighters who are now at the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration center are demanding to know when they will be reunited with their families. Many of them are married, they have wives and children and they want to go home. They were speaking to Fai Yengo Francis, coordinator of the DDR center. Derek Jato reports. I know that what you want me to open my mouth and say is that tomorrow you will be the this is what the over 100 ex separatist fighters now at the disarmament center in Boya wanted to hear. Push me to tell the lie. Don't want you to tell the lie here. And you should be patient. Fayengo Francis, the national coordinator of the disarmament commission earlier, announced a close to 2 billion project 
to construct a vocational training center for the empowerment of these former ex-separatist fighters. And he brought with him some consumable goods for their upkeep. That was good, but not enough, they told him. How long are we going to be here? Most of us are married. We need to go out and take care of our families. The government should respect their promises. One after each, they took turns and table their worries. Some of them, in dissatisfaction, walk out of the hall. Your message has been well received. Fai Yengo Francis, the national coordinator of the Disarmament Commission, assured these ex separatist fighters that things will be speedy, provided if the conditions are favorable. We are going to start in the next few days the construction of a, a huge center in Boya, a huge vocational center. It is so that tomorrow, when we are going to settle people, they should be able to fend for themselves. We should not take a few francs and give to these boys. They will not do anything. It's better to train them so that tomorrow they can be useful to their families and they can be useful to our country. The visit of the Disarmament Commission took the members to all the units and workshops to better assess the needs of these ex separatist fighters now in Boya, the Southwest Regional Capital. Traveling between Lum in the Mongo Division and Iyabasi in the Nkam Division has become a veritable nightmare. Cost of transportation has doubled and travelers now spend three days to complete a journey between the two localities as a result of the bad state of the road. For me, I'm Strong Sander. Has more. <laughs> A trip to Yabasi from the town of Lum in the Mungu division of the Litora region of Cameroon. <laughs> Yabasi is just about 80 kilometers away from Lum, but travelers have no assurance of a complete journey even within two days. <laughs> Look at the suffering we go through on the Lum Yabasi stretch of the road every day. Look at the number of people and vehicles. We have been here for over three days. We are really suffering. You see, every day we have this very particular problem. You stand here, after here you stand there. At times you pack all this. Plant all, 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 all your air condition along the roadside. You look from the road to your house by marching from one place to another. Helping, no way. We are already pleading. We are already pleading that the government should put us some. The road is unbearable. Cars and motorbikes all suffer the same fate. Lum, uh, Bonkeng, and Bonao, they shot the truck shot, but there's no way for me to, to cross around about. Lum, about is 100 kilometers, taking how many hours? Just, just look at the cocoa, the situation, to dry in the farm is a different case. Carry it before bringing a loop in a different case, before even the situation of the road. A situation that has paved a way for huge financial losses to traders, drivers and riders beyond the double cost of transportation. Yeah, the time that was, we are paying 6,000 each patient alone. Two people is, is 12,000 francs. But you reach there, it's not, it's not possible. From more than again, there's control. We are paying for control. For control, police and them stopping us. By the way, only up and down. I'm, I'm the situation has facilitated the perpetual hike in food prices in cities like Douala as food is allowed to rot in, in Yabasi. Cocoa, oranges, bears, but no way to export them. 
No way to export them. Oranges are rotting in the bush. You can't transport them. The price of selling, the transporting price, all, it just makes the situation is too much. Lucas says the nightmare has been on for over three years. They believe that money meant for the towering of this stretch of the national road number 16 has been swindled. At least one of the vaccines for coronavirus uh, indicates, there are indications that at least one of the vaccines for the coronavirus is uh, very effective in the terms of protection. Medics say this is good news, but a lot of challenges for Cameroon and other African nations, notably with regards to cost, affordability, distribution, storage, and other factors. And joining us from South Africa, Professor Henry Fomundan. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Professor Henry Fomundam is a pharmaceutical care and public health expert with many years working in several countries and uh, across the African continent in the areas of academia and uh, public health programs. He served as a member of the National Clinical Trial Committee at the Medicine Regulatory Authority in South Africa. Thank you for joining us today, sir. And we're talking about vaccines for the coronavirus pandemic and uh, early results of at least one of the vaccines show a significant level of protection. Can we know more about that? Sure. Thank you again, uh, Jonathan, for inviting me. Uh, this is very good news for the global health community that uh, we have a va we have a vaccine which can which has shown uh, a ninety percent prevention of the of the COVID uh, virus. But let me let me start with some good news. Uh, with the good news, and then I will tell you what the limitations are. Um, so uh, it, it it took about eight months for. BioNTech, which is the company, a biotechnology company in Germany, to forge together with Pfizer, which is a big pharmaceutical company in the U.S. And in eight months, they came up with, uh, with this vaccine. The second good news is that he used a mechanism, a technology that has never been used before. He used the human uh, uh, genetic processes to be able to produce the vaccine through what you call the messenger RNA. So it's called a messenger RNA um, a vaccine. And the third thing is that the results that we got from what you call a randomized double-blind uh, study, that is the, the, the poster child of what a clinical study should be. And so they did a randomized clinical study and the, re the preliminary results is showing that 90% of the patients would be protected in terms of if that vaccine is given. Now, the few limitations that I want to talk about is that we're going to have a major problem with production because there are millions of people in the U.S. and in Europe uh, that have prepaid for this uh, vaccine. And so a lot of the countries, particularly developing countries that may not have the resources, would probably be put at, at the back end of it, which means you need to start thinking about it. And the fact that this vaccine, um, it's a cold chain. We have to store it at about minus 80 degrees centigrade. That makes it very challenging uh, for Africa. And the results that we have, they're preliminary results. We don't know exactly is, is it going to work best in older people than in younger people. We're still waiting for that. And finally, we don't know of the long-term side effects of this medication because it's a brand new technology. But on paper, and the preliminary results are showing that we have very mild side effects of it. All right. What about cost? Well, the cost has not really been determined at this time uh, in terms of but what countries like the U.S. and the U.K. did was to put a whole chunk of money, um, advance it to the, to the company so that they can be the first when the drug comes out. Um, African countries normally would not be able to afford vaccines like this. Um, and that's why you have the WHO with a couple of donors putting money together. But it requires particularly a country like Cameroon to start looking right now as we speak, preparing, educate your population, make sure that there's a team that is talking to WHO to find out the funding, the fund funding mechanism that you're going to have. But most important, 
how are you going to distribute a drug that needs to be in the, uh, at, a, at 80 degrees? It has to be in a refrigerator. Not the kind of refrigerators that you use at home anyway. These are design manufacturer, uh, uh, design refrigerators for medications. Um, so those are the challenges that Cameroon and many African countries will have to start thinking about it immediately. How soon uh, can this vaccine be available for the world at large? Maybe African countries will certainly uh, not have it at the same time with the other countries like the United States, France, Germany, and all the rest. Right. So um, Pfizer and BioNTech um, are going to be applying for emergency approval in the next maybe three to four weeks because of this result that we have. Uh, the production is going to take place between now and the first quarter of the year. So we expect quite some production that will take place. But like I said before, the people that have prepaid, pre-financed, are going to be the first to go to get it. So I expect that uh, for the first half of the year to perhaps even towards the end of the year, uh, it will be the people that can afford it, uh, which will be the U.S., the U.K., and a couple of European countries will be able to afford it. Now, we don't know exactly how WHO is negotiating, but WHO usually negotiates on behalf of developing countries, which means Cameroon needs to put itself together and many African countries to make sure that they begin to have this discussion and not wait for the last minute like they usually do. All right, Professor, let's right. round up with uh, the uh, recent uh, statistics uh, in Cameroon. Uh, the, the figures have been increasing and the government is warning that the coronavirus is still there. People should continue respecting the anti-COVID-19 uh, measures. At the same time, there is also increase in figures in, the, in other uh, Western countries. What's the situation as of now? Well, the, let, me, let me say one of the things that a lot of pundits and everybody, all the scientific world, had predicted that Africa, including myself, that because of the healthcare system that we have in Cameroon and African countries, that Africa was going to bear the brunt of this. But thank God we're not. And the exact explanation of that, nobody actually knows uh, what the reasons are. A lot of reasons have been postulated. African population is young. Um, the African um, healthcare system may have endured a couple of things like Ebola, so they may know how to adjust to that. Some people think that the BCG vaccine that we take for TB as children may have some kind of protective effects, but these have not been proven. And so the, the rise that you see in Africa, in Cameroon in particular, it's, it's very minimal compared to what you see in Italy, in, in all the European countries, and, and, and in the US. And so that's very good news. Another good news, which is very unique, is that the, the, the recovery is, the, in Cameroon is about 96%. Uh, in the U.S., it's about 60-something percent. In South Africa, it's about 92%. So that's very good news for the continent. Although a lot of people think that reporting is not done properly, but we're not really seeing the mortality or people dying from this. So uh, to that effect, we're very happy that, um, for once, Africa is being spared by this. However, what you mentioned, which the government is saying, is that you cannot relent on making sure that the public health measures should be in place. The social distancing, uh, the using of sanitizers, and making sure that people don't go to occasions and, and forget about themselves. Although I've seen it very often, people go to funerals in Cameroon and, and they really uh, forget themselves. I think we need to continue to encourage people that even though there may be a vaccine that is very, very promising, um, it will take a long time, it may take a while to actually get to Cameroon. And even when it gets to Cameroon, getting to the villages will be very challenging. Professor Henry Fomunda and public health expert joining us from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up next, talking point. Thank you for staying with us in Talking Points. We are receiving a civil society activist and teacher, Diwum Emmanuel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Babel. The pleasure is mine. 
kidnappings continue in the two English-speaking regions of Cameroon. The last persons who were uh, kidnapped in the Livanda village in Limbe, uh, news streaming into our studio indicated that they have been set free, but kidnappings have continued rising. What's your reading of the situation? Well, uh, before I go to the reading of the situation, I, I really thank you people very much in Equinox for being the voice of the voiceless. There is no gain saying that without you people in Equinox, the low man, the common man, will never be heard. Coming back to your question, uh, it is very clear that even as we are talking here now, if we don't have a rapid change of mind, there will be kidnappings even this evening because the writing has not been done yet. And until that writing is done, we will be getting news of kidnaps every now and then. Change of mind. What do you change mean by change of mind? You know, when we talk about change of mind, uh, these kidnappings, as you are talking, is ex exclusively in the northwest and the southwest regions of Cameroon. And you know that the kidnappings are the spilled over of the war running across these two regions. And until the war is stopped by the real people, by the right people who have to stop it, the kidnappings will continue. Who are the right people who have to stop it? Well, uh, the right people are the Cameroonians. You know, we have been in war for four years. And what has been talking have been the guns and not the mouths. It is time to talk with the mouths and put down the guns. And to talk with the mouth and put down the guns, it means that we have to look at each other, eyeball to eyeball, and talk from heart to heart. But for the guns to go down, uh, it will certainly take what some people call negotiation, uh, others call it inclusive dialogue, and that seems not to be happening. And that's why the head of state has been calling on the pro-independence fighters to drop their guns and come out of the bushes. Some have done so, but many are still carrying their guns. Other civil society and political leaders have been calling on the government to call for a ceasefire, to withdraw the military into the, in this, from the society and bring them, take them back to their barracks, but that is not happening. Okay. Uh, I think this will be my take. Just imagine that you have a brother who was the breadwinner of the family and who died or who was killed. You know your heart can never be at peace because each time you think of it, it refreshes your memory on a sad note. And you know, they always say to stop a war, we stop counting corpses. And to stop counting corpses, we have to stop the guns first. And how do we stop the guns? A ceasefire. And that one, I think, it goes back to the head of state. If the head of state has the will and his government today to call for a ceasefire, I think boiling minds, boiling hearts will subside. And when they subside, we tell ourselves that we are ready to speak the truth because blood has been flowing in Cameroon like red oil in vegetables. So the head of state needs to take the lead. And I will even go far to think that, to me, personally, like other Cameroonians, why would the head of state not go to Bamenda and Boya to say, look, this thing has to stop? Because these people who are holding guns, most of them are illiterate. You need to know that. And to convince them is really hard. It was easy to pick up the guns. Even those who are controlling these people t holding the guns, I can bet you that some of them don't have control over the boys in the bushes. And so it is only coming back to the fact that the head of state who has the right given by the constitution if he really knows that he is the head of state for the people, 
he should go to Norway and Southwest. And talk to the people. Talk to the people. But he has been sending his co close collaborators there, Olala. prime ministers from Jan Filmon, the former prime minister, to Joseph John Gute, the president, uh, PM, and other ministers, other authorities to talk to the people, to discuss with the people, to bring solution to the people. Uh, Mr. Babila, let me be frank with you. You know, there's a difference between authoritative leaders and legitimate leaders. Most of these people who have been sent there, they have lost legitimacy. The people no longer listen to them. And when the people no longer listen to you, the people no longer believe in you. And when they don't believe in you, there is no meeting point for a common discussion. Latest information swimming into our newsroom from the Ansar Palace indicates that the phone has been set free, but on one condition that he has to go back to Yaoundé until the regional election is over before he can come back. In the Northwest region, where phones are highly respected, where phones are still respected today, despite the fact that. Uh, Observers are talking about politics that has entered the palaces, uh, bringing some kind of disrespect or distrust from the population. But phones are still being respected in the northwest region. And if a phone of his run is captured and detained for days, what can we understand in that? It's a complex, it's a complex issue, and complex issues need complex solutions. Complex, not in a multiple form, when I use the word complex. Because, like you are saying, we strongly condemn with the last energy, and I in person, strongly condemn with the last energy in me, the kidnap of funds, and even religious authorities. But please, let's come to think of it. You know, there was, there's a portion in the Bible that I fell in love with it in Matthew. When Peter told Jesus that I shall die with you, and Jesus told him that when the cock shall crow the second time, you shall deny me, and it happened. I think these phones need to review their consciences. If they review their consciences, they will know that they have forgotten that funds are not supposed to be politicians. But politicians are now controlling funds. Some people will tell me, like a professor told me in another platform, that funds in their position first are already political figures. And I say no. The funds are reserved only with the right to franchise. Because right to franchise is exercised in the ballot. And in the ballot, it is a secret. So the funds. I think they should distance themselves from politics. from politics, be more closer to their subjects, and then, only then, their subjects will be ready to die with them. Because if for two years you have not seen your subjects, and you don't know how they have been faring, and on the eve of a certain election, you are coming home to participate in that election, which of course, his right to franchise should be protected here, but you know the atmosphere in Northwest does not permit you to, to talk politics at this particular point. All right, before we go, students and teachers are also, are also uh, targeted. You are a teacher. What, what do you have to say about the fact that students, teachers, schools are now targets? Please, even you operating a god in the bush, you need little knowledge to be able to operate that goal. Let the kids go to school. Let the teachers be given the opportunity. Because the culture of war is no culture at all. It teaches only destruction. It never teaches, it never teach any construction. And uh, please, the both parties, the government and the separatists, permit us, the teachers, give us protection. Permit the children to go to school. Ndigum Emmanuel, teacher, civil society activist, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Mr. Babila.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today.